So today we are going to be analyzing circuits in the frequency domain. Oops, frequency has an F in it. So my goal for today is we are gonna analyze a single circuit several different ways to illustrate that all of the DC circuit analysis techniques and all that kind of good stuff that you guys have learned in your previous classes can be applied to frequency domain circuits in order to solve for quantities of interest, okay? So let's start with the following circuit where I have some sinusoidal voltage Vs of T, and I'll tell you what that guy, uh, what that will be in a few moments. Let's say that we have a 10 ohm resistor here, a five millihenry inductor here, a 20 ohm resistor here and let me do some math real quick since I'm making up numbers I want this to be in a particular range Uh, let's make this 800 microfarads. Um, let's say that Vs of T is 20 cosine 1000 T plus 10 degrees volts. And let's say that our quantities of interest are going to be this voltage, VR, and this current, IC of T. So as it stands right now, our circuit has a time domain representation. And I can see that because I have inductors and capacitors that are expressed in millihenries and microfarads as opposed to dealing with impedances. Okay? So in order to not have to use a terrifying amount of trig and calculus, the first thing that we need to do to analyze the circuit and to determine those two unknown quantities is to convert our circuit from the time domain into the frequency domain. And we're going to do that by using the relationships that we talked about in our last class, right? So to convert to the frequency domain, I'm going to redraw my circuit. And the first thing that I am going to do is I'm going to replace all of my voltages and currents with their phasor equivalents. Okay. So the most obvious signal that we need to convert from the time domain into the frequency domain is our source voltage 20 cosine 1000 T plus 10 degrees. So what's the phasor representation of that voltage? So cosine means we leave the phase angle alone. 
right? We don't have to subtract 90 degrees or anything like that. So if we want the phasor equivalent, what do we do? We keep the magnitude, we keep the phase angle, and we throw everything else away. I'm sorry, what was that, Caitlin? 20 angle 10, absolutely right. So we have 20 angle 10 degrees volts. While I'm at it, I'm gonna label this as a phasor voltage VR and label this as a phasor current IC. So we have effectively converted all of our time domain voltage and current signals into their frequency domain equivalent. The next thing we're gonna to need to do is to determine the impedance of all of the resistors, capacitors, and inductors. So what is the impedance of a 10 ohm resistor? 10 ohms. For a resistor, it does not change, right? So the 10 ohm resistor continues to be a 10 ohm resistor. Similarly, the 20 ohm resistor will continue to be a 20 ohm resistor. What about our five millihenry inductor? What do we do to convert that from the time domain into the frequency domain? Or what's the impedance of an inductor? You guys have notes, arguably. I hope you took them last class. So the impedance of an inductor, J omega L, okay? So you had parts of it, right? That two pi times the frequency, that's omega. Um, the number of Henry's is the inductance. The J is pretty important though. Um, so let's figure some stuff out here. So here's J. What's omega? I've definitely given it to you. Oh. So that two pi relationship comes when I give you a linear frequency. So if I tell you the circuit is operating at 60 hertz or something like that, that's an example of a linear frequency. And you would multiply 60 hertz times two pi to get omega. In this case, I didn't give you a linear frequency. How are we going to figure out what frequency our circuit is oscillating at? What's well, in the description of the voltage up there, right? This voltage waveform here is of the form V is equal to Vm cosine omega t plus some phase angle theta V volts. So omega is whatever is being multiplied by t in our excitation signal here, right? So in this case, omega is simply 1000 radians per second where the angular frequency is always expressed in a thousand radians per second. So we're gonna have 1000 radians per second. L is five millihenries. So that's five times 10 to the minus three. Um, let's see, and a henry is a volt second per ampere. So these per seconds cancel these seconds. Radians is a dimensionless quantity. So we're gonna have J times a thousand times 0 0.005, which comes out to be, you guys have calculators or you could maybe do it in your head. Multiply the numbers, tell me what you get. Just five, yep, J five ohms. Right. Now we need to determine the impedance of our capacitor. So what's that relationship? Not L. So you, yeah, so L is for inductors, C is for capacitors. So you're very, very close. You've actually mixed up the two different relationships. It's not one over negative J omega C, it's one over J omega C or negative J over omega C. 
yeah but you're 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 real close you just jumbled up the two different ways to do it um so let's put it as negative j over omega c okay um so that's going to look like negative j divided by a thousand radians per second and then C here was 800 micro, so that's 800 times 10 to the minus six, and a farad is an amp second per volt. So the per seconds cancel the seconds here, and so we're going to wind up with something that is one over amps per volt, which is the same thing as a volt per amp or an ohm. Uh, so for the numbers, what are we going to get? So what's one over a thousand times 800 times 10 to the minus six. I got the reciprocal of that. Okay. So 1.25 or 5 fourths. Yeah. So negative uh, J, 5 fourths of an ohm. Okay. So this is what our circuit looks like in the frequency domain. Okay. So now, we have a multitude of different ways that we can analyze this. So I am going to copy this so that we can reuse it. And let's look at our first means, okay? So this first method, is in some ways the simplest way to do it, but it's also the longest way to analyze it. We're simply going to use Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and Ohm's law, as well as impedance combination techniques to determine the quantities that we're looking for. Like I said, this is the simplest method. There's no fancy tricks or anything like this. It's just brute force doing it with uh, the simplest relationships that are possible. Okay. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to find the equivalent resistance or the equivalent impedance of my network, right? So here's my 10 ohm resistor. Here's my J5 ohm inductor. My 20 ohm inductor, or excuse me, resistor. My minus J five fourths ohm capacitor. And I'm gonna find the equivalent impedance. So what should this equivalent impedance look like? Not expecting a numerical answer here yet. That's what calculators are for, but we should be able to kind of look at this thing and figure out what's going on, right? So what is this going to look like? Okay, so we're gonna have 20 ohms in series with, let me write this, minus J five-fourths of an ohm. Okay, I agree with that. And we'll do that math in a moment. What will our next step be? In parallel with J5, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And then what else? 
all that is in series with the tip. 100% correct. So now we'll just go through the steps of doing this. Um, so that is going to look like 10 ohms plus J5 ohms times 20 minus J5 fourths of an ohm over J5 ohms plus 20 minus J5 fourths of an ohm. Are you guys familiar with this way of doing parallel combinations product over the sum? It only works for two, but since we have two impedances, that'll work. All right, so I'm going to throw this into my calculator. Suggest you guys do the same. So 10 plus 5i over 20 minus 1.25i over 5i plus 20 minus 1.25 I got 11.208 plus J 4.774 ohms in rectangular form. or 12.182 with an angle of 23.070 degrees ohms in polar form. Anybody else get similar results? Okay. So now that I know this equivalent impedance, am I okay to scroll to the next screen or you guys need a moment? Yes, sir. So the thousand, uh, excuse me, the thousand radians per second is the omega or the excitation frequency of the whole system, right? So if we have a single voltage source or a single current source in a system and it is oscillating at a thousand radians per second, everything is oscillating at a thousand radians per second. So that's just part of the back will be given. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I have to give you the frequency in some form. Okay. So for the in-class assignment that we did on last Thursday, I said you're operating at a linear frequency of, I think, one kilohertz or something like that. For this one, the angular frequency is buried inside of that time domain voltage waveform. Okay. So yeah, I have to give you an omega or you can't know. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm happy to answer anything you're willing to ask of. Okay. All right, so we know what the equivalent impedance connected to our voltage source is. So I'm going to redraw our circuit or a simplified representation of our circuit here. So we have... Twenty angle ten degrees volts connected to our equivalent impedance of eleven point two oh eight plus J four point seven seven four. So what does this allow me to calculate? Current, for sure, okay? 
So I'm gonna do this in blue because this isn't specifically one of the quantities that we're looking for, but the current that is leaving my source. So I'm gonna call this IVS, current that's leaving my voltage source. What's that gonna be mathematically, right? Not looking for a number, looking for the equation here. Impedance, absolutely right. So just good old Ohm's law, right? I is equal to V over R, or V over Z in this case, since we're in the frequency domain. So that's gonna be 20 angle, 10 degrees volts divided by that impedance of 11.208 plus J 4.774 ohms. I got 1.642 with an angle of negative 13.070 degrees amps. Typically speaking, I prefer to express voltages and currents in polar form and impedances in rectangular form but it doesn't particularly matter which way you guys choose to do it. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and convert this into rectangular form for you all, just in case that's what your calculator is set in and that's what your preferred thing is. Um, one point five, excuse me, five nine nine. minus J 0 0.371 amps. The number that you got may be ever so slightly different uh, because I saved the full 11.208 blah, blah, blah stuff in my calculator as a variable so that I wouldn't have any rounding error when I did this. So if you just typed in 20 angle 10 over 11.208 plus uh, J 4.774. Your answer may be very slightly different than mine. That's just a little bit of rounding error, not that big of a deal, uh, but you should be getting something close to this. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to the previous circuit diagram here real quick. We just found this current, right? Because we represented everything to the right of the voltage source with its electrical equivalent, we figured out the current that was leaving the positive polarity terminal of the voltage source, we can now use that current in our original circuit to figure things out. So it looks to me like we can figure out what the quantity VR is right now. How would we do that? Just the current times the impedance of 10 ohms, absolutely correct. So just Ohm's law again. So VR as a phaser, and actually I should put hats over these because they are phasers. It's just going to be 10 ohms times that phasor current IVS which is going to come out to be 15.993 minus J 3.7 one three amps or 
in polar form, 16.418 with an angle of negative 13.070 degrees. Oh, excuse me. That should very much be volts because we're finding a voltage. My apologies. So just as a subtle thing here, are we all okay with the application of Ohm's law that I've done here? Nothing particularly wild or crazy, I don't think. Um, our ultimate goal here was to figure out what this voltage drop across our resistor was in the time domain. And we figured out what the voltage drop across our resistor was in the frequency domain. So we now need to convert our phaser back into a sinusoidal signal to get the real answer for what I'm looking for. Okay. How are we going to do that? I don't know that we actually did this the other day, but it's pretty much we take the um, magnitude, take the phase angle, and then unthrow away all of the cosine omega t part. Right. So we know that omega is a thousand. So VR of T is just going to be 16.418 cosine 1000 T minus 13.070 degrees volts, right? So we kept the magnitude the same, we kept the phase angle the same, and we just put back in that cosine omega t part. That's how we convert from the frequency domain back to the time domain. And in that conversion, we're always going to get a cosine function. It's because I... That's what I asked for. That's it. So in our original circuit, we're looking for as a function of time, right? So that's why we converted it back into the time domain. It's semantics. It's because that's what I asked for, so that's what we're doing. Uh, is there any practical reason to do it? Not particularly because it carries the exact same information as the phaser representation does. If you forgot to do that on an exam or something like that, that would be like a one point mistake. Like it's trivial because it really doesn't matter. You did all the analysis right. You just forgot one dumb thing that I asked you for. So I'm not going to be too much of a jerk about that. All right. So now what can we do next? Or what? There's lots of things we can do. So I guess a better question would be, what should we do next? Anybody have any thoughts? Well, yeah, that's the obvious thing. That's our ultimate goal is to solve for that current, but we're not in a state to where we can solve for it directly, at least not using just Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law or Ohm's law, okay? Um, so, we could use Kirchhoff's voltage law to determine what this voltage VL is, right? Because we could write a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around that left-hand loop. And then once we know what that voltage VL is, we're one step away from figuring out what that current IC is. Yes, ma'am? We can do that using current division. You're hundred percent correct. So would you prefer to do current division? We can we can amend this because that's absolutely a way to do things here. It will eliminate a step. You're hundred percent correct. So okay, well, let's do current division. All right. So what Caitlin has suggested, not what I was intended to do here, but that'll be okay if you guys are hitting me with stuff. I would much prefer that than me just up here for two hours just throwing bullshit at you guys. Um, 
since we know the current that's entering into this node right here, we can use current division to figure out how much of that splits off and flows through the capacitor, right? So modifying things here from my intention, but I'm happy to do it. How did you guys learn current division? I know that might be an odd question, but what equation are you familiar with? All right, so did you do current division as, let's say, I1 would be I total times one over, let's call it R1 divided by one over R1 plus one over R2, or did you learn it as I1 would be equal to I total times R2 over R1 plus R2? Or is the answer none of the above? And if the answer is none of the above, then I'm going to teach you how, guys how to do current division correctly. All right. So um, not to disparage whoever taught you the second one, but it's garbage and I don't care for it. Okay. So the reason why I say it's garbage and I don't care for it is because it only works for exactly two elements in parallel. Um, and it is arbitrarily confusing because the thing that's in the numerator is the branch that you don't want, which to me is confusing. Um, mathematically, these two representations are perfectly equivalent um, for exactly two branches. But the one that I have over here on the left can be applied to any number of branches in parallel. So it's the reciprocal of the branch you want to find the current through divided by the sum of the reciprocals of all of the branches in parallel. So it doesn't matter if you have two or 50, it can be applied. So this is the one that I very much prefer you guys to use. If you're comfortable with the other one, it is what it is, and you know that it can only be applied to two and all that kind of jazz. It's not wrong. It's just I don't care for it because I am an opinionated jackass. Okay. So. so we are going to find the current IC. So that is going to be the current IVS. So the branch that I'm looking for the current through isn't just the capacitor by itself, right? It's actually that 20 ohms in series with the capacitor. So I need to make sure I include that. So that's going to be one over 20 minus J five fourths of an ohm divided by one over J5 plus one over that same 20 minus J five fourths of an ohm. I got 0 0.6, oh, excuse me, 162 plus J 
zero point three six nine amps or in polar form zero point four zero three with an angle of 66.310 degrees amps. Anybody else got something similar? Good deal. Since our goal here was to get this in the time domain, IC of T is 0 0.403 cosine 1000 T plus 66.310 degrees amps. So we've determined our two quantities of interest. So we are done with this method. Like I said, not quite the way that I figured we would go about doing it for IC, but perfectly reasonable, okay? So let's talk about, or actually before we do this, anybody have any problem with any of the analysis that we've done solving it in this particular way, right? There's a multitude of different ways that we can do that. And so we're just gonna go through some of the other ways here now. Um, because even though we cut out a step using this way, I firmly believe there's still a quicker way to do this. In fact, I know for sure there is at least two. So anybody have any problems with anything that we've done to this point? All right. So let's take a stab at this problem in a slightly different way. So one way that we could simplify this analysis would be to use the principle of voltage division. Now you may look at this circuit and you may say, I don't think voltage division can work here. And I disagree with you wholeheartedly. We just have to be careful about what we're doing, right? So we could use voltage division to solve for the voltage VR directly. Knowing the voltage VR, we could then solve for the voltage drop across the inductor using either voltage division or Kirchhoff's voltage law, and then use voltage division. Actually, um, we could use voltage division again to solve for the voltage drop over just the capacitor, or we could simply use Ohm's law once we know the voltage drop over the inductor. So let's use voltage division to figure out what VR is, okay? And then from there, effectively, we're at the same place we were at with the previous circuit uh, in the previous analysis when uh, Caitlin suggested we do current division. So using voltage division, we are going to have VR is equal to 20 angle 10 degrees volts. So what goes in the numerator of my voltage division equation? The impedance that I'm trying to find the voltage drop over, which in this case is the 10 ohm resistor, right? So I'm gonna have the 10 ohm resistor up here. And then what goes in the denominator of my voltage division relationship is the total series resistance seen by my voltage source, which in this case is 10 ohms plus the 20 minus J5 fourths branch in parallel with the J5 branch, right? My stylus full right. Okay. 
like so. So I'm going to have 20 angle 10 degrees times 10 over what I previously stored as X, because that's just the equivalent impedance we found way at the beginning of the last problem. And this comes out to be 15.993 minus J 3.713 volts or Sixteen point four one eight angle negative thirteen point zero seven zero degrees volts. I'm simply going to scroll up here and check to make sure that this matches what we got a few moments ago. Sixteen point four one eight angle negative thirteen point oh seven zero. So exact same result in a single step that it took us three steps to get it over. Right. So that's how we could use voltage division to figure out VR straight from the jump. Okay. Are you guys familiar with source transformations? So a source transformation is a technique that we can use whenever we have some voltage source in series with some resistance RS. And we can convert it to a current source. in parallel with some resistance RS. Did you guys learn about this transformation? Do you remember what the rules are? Just own the law again, right? So VS will be IS times RS or IS will be VS over RS, et cetera, okay? So we could do a source transformation on our original circuit. So we're gonna have 20 angle, 10 degrees. It's in series with a 10 ohm resistor, right? So that's gonna look like two angle, 10 degrees amps. In parallel, with a 10 ohm resistor. And then the rest of the circuit remains exactly the same, right? So over here, we're gonna have the J5 ohm resistor. Here we have the 20 ohm resistor. The negative J5 fourths of an ohm. Um, capacitor, and then here's that current IC. Well, the reason why I would do a source transformation like this is because now I have a single current that's splitting up between three different branches, and I can easily just apply current division to solve for IC without knowing literally anything else in the circuit, right? So it's a much quicker way to get that current IC. So using current division, much like we did it earlier, go away. We would have two angle 10 degrees amps. In our numerator, we're gonna have one over Twenty minus J five fourths of an ohm. In our denominator, we're going to have one over ten plus one over J five plus one over twenty minus J 
five fourths. And we solve for IC in effectively two steps now, doing a source transformation and then applying the principles of current usage. So if we throw this in our calculator, we get 0 0.162 plus J 0 0.369 amps or in polar form 0 0.403 angle 66.310. Degrees amps, if I'm not mistaken, this exactly matches what we got earlier, doing several more steps. So this is another way that we can take a crack at this circuit using source transformation, current division, and voltage division to get our quantities of interest in a more straightforward fashion. All right, so we are almost done beating this problem to death. There's one other way that I want to show you. There's three or four additional different ways, but this is one of the ways that I like the most, particularly for these circuits that only contain a single source to analyze things and get the information quickly, okay? Um, black. I'm gonna call this modified nodal analysis. And the reason why I'm calling it modified nodal analysis is because I'm not going to go through the full nodal analysis procedure. I'm going to make some simplifications that will allow me to effectively set up a one equation, one unknown system that I can solve for. And then from there, I can get everything that I want. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose this bottom node to be my ground. And I'm going to use nodal analysis to solve for this nodal voltage Vx. And knowing only this voltage Vx, I will be able to solve for Vr in one step and Ic in one step. So, when I perform nodal analysis, I'm adding the currents that are leaving my node of interest, right? So I'm gonna write a Kirchhoff's current law equation. And that equation is going to be Vx minus 20 angle 10 degrees volts divided by 10 ohms. So that's my current directed to the left plus Vx over J5 ohms. That's my current directed down. Plus Vx over 20 minus J5 fourths of an ohm is equal to zero. So effectively, I'm eliminating a node at that top right-hand corner by lumping those two impedances together into a single impedance, okay? And at this point, it's just algebra. We only have one unknown quantity, right? So I could say that there is a factor of Vx that's being multiplied by one over 10 ohms from my first term, one over J5 ohms from my second term, and one over 20 minus J five fourths of an ohm from my third term. And this is going to be equal to 
the constants that I move to the other side, which is just 20 angle 10 degrees volts over 10 ohms. This thing right here is just a number. So I'm going to go ahead and just type that into my calculator and store it as a variable. So 1 over 10 plus 1 over 5i plus 1 over 20 minus 1.25i. I'm going to store this in my calculator as variable a. And so a is equal to 0 0.14, excuse me, 150, rounding correctly, minus J, 0 0.197. And the units here, if you are interested, is one over ohms or a semen. This guy over here, I'm going to store in my calculator as B, and that's going to be two angle. 10 degrees amps. Vx is simply going to be B over A. which I get to be, excuse me, 3.704 plus J7.186 volts. I'm going to store that as C. And then VR is just, 20 angle 10 degrees volts minus Vx. Or 15.993 minus J3.713 volts. or 16.418 angle negative 13.070 degrees volts the exact same uh, excuse me the exact same answer we got every other way we work this thing and ic is just going to be vx divided by 20 minus j five fourths of an ohm I get to be 0 0.162 plus J 0 0.369 or 0, stop scrolling screen, you're bothering me, 403. Angle sixty six point three one zero degrees amps. Again, the exact same thing we got every other way of working, right? So there are multiple, multiple different ways to work pretty much every problem that I'm going to throw at you. Whatever you're comfortable with is okay by me. Um, that being said, exams and things have a time limit. Um, so figuring out ways like this one or using uh, voltage division, current division and stuff like that to eliminate steps and simplify the analysis will generally be in your best interest, okay? Um, all right, so that is enough ranting out of me for today. So we have an in-class assignment. It consists of a whopping one problem. Once you're done with that, you're free to leave.